like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce just about eight to ten minutes summary of each of the areas that are going to be discussed in more detail in the discussion panel, the breakout session. And the basic idea is you don't know it's a challenge to step out of what our focus is, whether that's education or housing, etc. But the reality that we also know, in spite of our resources, is they're all, they're all interconnected. You know, I hate to use the old adage, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? But that, if you're in education, nobody, education is number one, it comes before everything. If you're in health, you know, you know? And, and so it is a challenge you know, to work across these issues. But I hope that what you already see, even in terms of setting the table presentation, that fundamentally it doesn't make the difference on the issue. You know, yes, in terms of you know the uniqueness of each one, what we need to do as strategies, etc. Not to say the least of the kind of dollars we need to make it happen. But nonetheless, those under structural political issues, policy issues, how do we move those agendas? Because we can go to Austin, if I get you already heard what the budget looks like, so do that for Oh, you we need some more money for economic development and housing, or we need to do this in healthcare, or we need to do this in job training. But guess what? You're just going to it's going to have you go in circles because that structural problem of the way you know we collect taxes is not it's not there. So are we putting our energies correctly, or not? Or are we double up to put the very and so it, it's, it's really a predicament. Uh, but again, the point here in terms of the summaries, we kind of wanted everyone to kind of get a little bit of a flavor of each of those areas in terms of the summary way. But each of the panels will discuss them in more detail. And also, we don't want to, uh, we don't presume that even in the hard work that uh, the folks have done to put together their discussion papers, it could be that you're sitting at the table at the discussion panel and say, okay, you didn't touch on this one. Let me in. As long as you need to put it on the table. And so I just want to mention that as well. So I'd like to ask, we have three, four uh, individuals, and again, I thank them very much for taking the time and effort to do this for us. And, and I'm just going to quickly introduce all four of them, and then one at a time have them come up and uh, and so they come from four different campuses throughout the state, uh, and it's really nice to see that, number one. And I'd like to start with Elena Escavio uh, from the University of Texas at El Paso around education. Elena, for <laughs> favor. Thank you, everybody. Let me get this up. <coughs> Let me raise everybody else's. So first of all, one, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you first and foremost for saying that let's put the budget aside as we talk about education, because if we don't, then we won't move forward. We know that, right? And Eva, over here, Eva, I want her grades, all right? I want her grades. I mean, the way she's out there. The way she understands the budget is amazing. It's amazing. It was depressing, right? <laughs> But I do think that we have opportunities for short-term goals, right? Short-term action, and then long-term goals with that given in mind. And Dean Science, thank you so much for all the demographic information. Oh my goodness. And there's so much. You can get on there and look for demographics and depending you know, on the perspective, and the person, and the year, and the groups, you get a whole different you know, uh, ball of numbers. But the thing that we do know is that no matter how you look at it, you're Latinos, all right, by the lowest performing across the board. That we do, no matter how you look at demographics. And at the same time, you know, it's important that we understand that, and I think it was Eva that said, oh my God, I'm getting everybody confused. I think it was Eva that said at a time where, where we need the best education for our kids, what's happening to the budget? It's shrinking. Right? So we have to get really, really strong here, and we have to get very, very collectively, you know, work together and, and, and see what we can do. So I call this the state of 
you know, Latino education. So here are some demographics right here. These are the five largest states with the largest Hispanic population, right? According to Pew 2016. So these states hold 65% of all Hispanics. Texas is only two, right? That California leads right now. That was shared also. Nationally, the Hispanic dropout rate has declined somewhat, and college enrollment has increased. However, the economic factors still remain a barrier to many of our kids getting to college. And because of that, they choose to go to two-year programs, which are mostly community colleges and go into universities, right? because they need to work, because of tuition, and because they need to work. So this really says something to the decrease that we've had in federal funding for Pell Grants and all these other funds that come in that actually support financial aid and support our students. They're shrinking. They're shrinking. This is national. In Texas, Latinos are the largest ethnic group in public schools, and we rank 28 in per student spending. And, and right now in our schools, Latinos comprise more than 50% of our student population. In our schools, 52.2% of that alone is enrollment in 2015-2016 school year, and 64.3% of those are our babies coming in at pre-kindergarten grade. We talk about services, right? Services that have to be there to families and, and, and children at that age. And access, access to early childhood, that's extremely important. If you look at the class of 20, uh, 2015 four-year graduation rate, Asian students are at the top. White, follow, believe it or not. Hispanics then come next, and then our African-American population fall on fourth place. But Hispanic high school graduates are more likely, again, to attend a two-year college rather than a four-year college program because of economics, because of economics. Now, there's something that we have in the state known as dual credit education, and it's going on in several places all over, all over the state. And this is really an opportunity for students in high school to take a course that is taught by a teacher who's credentialed by SACS, our credentialing institution, to teach these courses that are a little more advanced, maybe a little more, there's more rigor in them, but the kids are getting dual credit. They're getting high school credit and they're getting credit at the university. So what does this do? It saves money because they're not paying tuition, okay? Number two, it shortens the length, the time to graduation. And for our Latino population, guys, that is a game changer. That is a game changer right there. Right, so they're coming out, we started out with a thousand programs, and I think we're in the hundred thousand programs now statewide. I know that the UT system right now has a huge research piece where they're looking into dual credit because they're questioning quality. All right, they're questioning quality. Well, first of all, the teachers that teach in those programs are credentialed already. They have to have a master's and they have to have 18 hours in that area that they're teaching. And that's the problem. I wonder, I, I thought for a while, why don't we have more of these? Why just a certain population? Why don't all schools teach this way? And it has to do with the credentials. So the more teachers we can get, we get those 18 hours on top of the masters on the courses that are most offered in the colleges as they're coming in, the more we can make this accessible to students. The courses are histories, English, a lot of English, a lot of biology, a lot of the core courses that are there. And so students are just doing amazing. All right, we've got uh, some uh, of these students in, uh, at UTIP, and they're amazing. It's incredible. And, and we did some focus groups with them, the research with some focus groups with these students to find out what their, their, their trajectory was like. The transition from high school to the university was a lot easier because they got, they got used to the rigor in the course load. Um, they also felt more motivated. They were you know, interested in learning. So there are a lot of positives that are there, not just the, uh, the amount of money that they're saving. But for, for our Latino population, that, that number one reason that we're behind this is poverty. Poverty is everything. Well, you said poverty. You know, Mr. Floyd said poverty. We talked about poverty. We said that's the big one, absolutely. So for our kids, this program here is a game changer. And so we hope that the research that they do does, in fact, put it back on track. Now, <clears throat> from this population, Latinos, right, comes our largest number of what they call English learners, ELs, all right, English learners. And you can see on the map here where they're just exploding all over the country. Traditional states like Texas, California, Florida, New Mexico, New York, you know, we've been at it for a long time and in larger concentrations. But all of a sudden you have South. The South, you've got Arkansas, 
You've got places that never had English learners before and now exploding. Why are the students going there? Why are the families going there? It's economics. I've been going to Arkansas for the last 16 years. 16 years. The first year I went, the kids were little. All right? They were little kids. They were cute then. They were cute. These Latinos were cute. They're not cute anymore. They're in middle school and high school. And the scores have blown up, right? And that's what's happened. So changing that kind of understanding, the, the challenges that English learners have, and having access to a full curriculum. And that's where we are really seriously in need of demanding and monitoring. And that is the curriculum that your English learners are receiving is watered down. Okay, it's simplified because the English isn't there. We don't want that. They have to have access to rigor. And that takes a lot of good training for teachers. They're the fastest growing group and they're very diverse. Somebody said this morning we had a lot of diversity in our Chicanos and Mexican Americans, so we're not going to get away. We also have a lot of diversity in the kinds of ways that we have in terms of newcomers. We have a lot of newcomers. Being on the border, we have a lot of newcomers. There's two kinds of newcomers. One newcomer has everything to do with families that are fleeing and they've had interrupted schooling and there are low education levels in the family. So the students that we get have low little literacy skills and on top of that, they have to learn English. And on top of that, they only have so many years to complete what they need to complete in order to graduate. Which means the instructional piece is extremely important. The training of teachers and principals and counselors Preparation of all that is really important. It was depressing to see a 21% budget, you know, for higher ed. But we have work to do too in order to prepare the best for the kids that are really struggling right now. We also have newcomers, though, that come from very well educated families. All right, and so they have the background. Those flounder around a little bit at the beginning, but then they're in the general program and they're fine. All right, we're referring to these students as emergent bilinguals. Because when we use the English learner term alone, we have totally dismissed the bilingualism and the biliteracy that they bring with them and everything else. You've wiped it out. And so politically, all right, politically correct now is to use emergent bilinguals, EBs. We're so full of acronyms, I, I recognize that. But as the statement says, we're doing it for a reason. If we talk about our English learners, they've increased by a lot between 25, 26, and all the way up to 2015, 2016. This has put a lot of pressure on schools, right? Because they don't have, or they haven't had the personnel that knows how to teach someone that doesn't speak English completely, and how to teach them their science or social studies or math. Critically, beyond just getting it, beyond just comprehending what they're reading, but being able to interact, engage, and really get at the rigor of the content that needs to be there. In 2015-2016 school year, 18.5% of the student populations were identified as English learners or emergent bilinguals. And for a total of 980,590 in 2016. That's a lot. That is a lot. Spanish speakers constitute 90% of that population. And I always say in Texas, you know, we don't have an excuse, right? We don't have an excuse. We have the language here. We should be using it to help them learn better. It's all political. It's all political. And out of this number, these are the numbers up here that participate in any kind of language support program. And we basically have two, and they come in many flavors. That's part of the issue. One of them has everything to do with providing the child some Spanish language support, all right, while they learn English. So you mean the student has to learn Spanish in order to learn English? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're saying. The student learns content, so he doesn't get behind academically. He continues his growth while he's learning English. They have to be done together. Okay? And that's, those programs are generally at the elementary level. As we get into middle school and high school, we get worse. We have English as a second language. So usually students in middle school and high school are sent to an ESL class where they learn, you know, the colors, the numbers, hello, my favorite color is jello, you know, whatever, all of that. They learn those magical phrases, but they miss, you know, they go to science, social studies, mathematics, and they're in sick or swim. Unless those teachers have been trained and how to make instruction comprehensible and maintain the rigor of the content area that needs to be there. Okay. Uh, those are the two approaches that we have for the most. All right, you can look on TEA and then we have a little bit of variation in them, but basically those are the goals that are there. Again, they're diverse because we have new arrivals, some that come with prior schooling, some that come with interrupted schooling, and this is the group that I was mentioning earlier. This is a group that we really need to tackle right now. 
and they're known as long-term English learners. LTEL is another acronym, all right? But these are students who have been in our school seven or more years and have still not achieved academic literacy and still have incurred academic gaps. And guess what? These are first, second, and third generation U.S. born students. So they're not even immigrants. What's going on? Okay, they're coming in and, and they're not getting the support that they need. We have a shortage of bilingual teachers out there. All right? We're losing bilingual teachers left and right. We really need to recruit them. We need to get that going because these students need a lot. And, this, and, the, and their trajectory into becoming long-term elf begins at the elementary level. We don't see the results until they get to middle school or high school. That's when we see them. There was a lot of work done in California on long-term English learners by Lori Olson. And um, the first step was really coming to terms with, do we even identify them? We don't have a way to identify them. We don't have a way in our TEA system. We don't even see the word long-term English learner on the system. I think we're in denial here in Texas. New York doesn't, New Mexico doesn't, California doesn't, and that's what we need to do. Our long-term English learners need to be identified now because they need more than what is, what is right now in practice. They need additional support right now so that they can move up. Otherwise, they're dropping out. We have the highest dropout rate, right, and the lowest graduation rate among these groups right here. <clears throat> I wanted to check in the sound to see if you could hear this. Let me give you a little context. In uh, El Paso, in the last six years ago, seven years ago, we went through a really sad situation because what districts start doing um, because they don't want scores to be affected. Remember, I went to Arkansas and they thought they were cute and they weren't cute anymore when they were in high school. They started disappearing a lot of these long term English learners. And they started not counting them in the accountability system so they wouldn't lower their, their, their rates. It's not the students' fault, right? We create these kinds of long term English learners here. And uh, absolutely, the superintendent was. He went to jail for three years, right? He went to jail after all this was uncovered, right? But what happened to so many students is a shame. They were told not to come back to school. They were told to drop out because they weren't going to make it. It's better if they just went out and worked. And they believed it. And unfortunately, it happens in the more marginalized, you know, communities and populations. When parents don't know their rights. Parents don't know how to work the system. All right? And people can get away with it. So I want you to hear a long-term English story. Sometimes I dream about being in school with my friends, um, in lunch, in class, working, writing, and then I wake up knowing that it's just a dream. Like, I can't go back. I didn't think of having babies like that. I think that if I had graduated, I, I would have babies. I don't get the end. So she was dropped and she got pregnant and now she's at home with a baby. This is one of those long term English learners, okay? That was asked. Oops, sorry. Let me go to the next one. Oh. I was crying. I went to my locker to pick up my books. Then I went to Wise to tell my mom about it. And um, I told her that they dropped me. She called my father. He started like yelling at me. You don't want to do anything with your life. That was uh, the last time I I seen him. I'm now working in a kitchen. I'm doing pizzas and washing dishes. I don't speak any, any English at all. I mean, I'm not doing anything. I wanted to finish school. My dream was to have a business in a tortilleria. I believe that if we didn't drop me, I would still be talking to my father. So these are the Sonyas of the world. These are your long-term English learners, and I was able to interview. Them. I was able to interview. Um, that's not her name. That's not her picture. Right? That's a pseudo word. And um, get from a lot of students what happened when these students are not 
producing the kinds of scores that schools want to see, then this is what happens. And it just didn't happen here. It's happened in many other states, and people have been you know, getting caught on this. But I wanted to show you what's going on with the Sonyas. If you look at this chart right here, or right, if you look at this chart right here, your ESL programs are all here. Okay, now let me, let me explain what this is. This is a very famous graph known as the graph. Okay. And it was developed by the research that was led by Thomas and Collier. Thomas and Collier did a longitudinal study that looked at, the, they followed three questions. The first question was, where are the, the districts in the country that have the largest number of emergent bilinguals, English learners? Right? The second question was, what are the programs that they're implementing for these kids to help them succeed academically? The third question was, what are their effects? Which are the programs that are working? And which are the ones that are not working, okay? So these are the programs that are listed here. So right here you've got what's really blooming right now all over the place is dual language education, right? Dual language education is where all kids, your kids, my kids, all kids come together to learn in both languages from pre-K all the way to 12 and they're meeting, you know, the demands for a global economy, the job market that's out there, they're bilingual, they're biliterate, they're Zooming and, and a lot of English speaking parents have their children in there, all right? Then you've got all the other programs down here, okay? The green lines here are your dual language kids. What you see here, this is a broken line. The broken line that's right here is the average performance of an English speaker. So in a year, you expect at least 50% down on your assessment, okay? And over here are your NCEs, which is your, you know, your star, your tax, whatever it is that they use for testing. So if you look at this and you follow this, you see which are the programs that are really making a difference. Yet most of the programs that we have are implemented here. And for our second language learners and our Sonyas that you just saw, these are the programs that they were in. And what you're referring to here is the academic gap. Here's the academic gap right here. So what happens with kids that are going through this academic gap? It becomes meaningless for them. School doesn't have a purpose anymore. They disengage and they become very passive and they grow out. They need to get out and work. I want to show you this graph because this is a good way of districts or schools to look at their trajectory in creating long-term English learners. This is a snapshot of a district in Texas, right? These are star scores right here. If you look at the third grade, so the third graders that are that are that are English learners in math and reading, you see that 76 passed the math. Oops, 76 passed the math. And 70% passed the reading. Reading is always harder to pass, all right? 24 did not pass the math, 30% did not pass the reading. If you go to the fourth grade of these L's, okay, you see that it goes down. Only 66% passed the math, and only 62% passed the reading. Let's go to fifth grade. Only 68 passed the math, and 56 passed the reading. Right here, in schools, we should be seeing this pattern. We should be seeing that to immediately start looking at the curriculum and the kind of instruction that needs to be, the kind of teacher training that schools need, the kind of programs we need to be approaching for our students. If you go all the way to seventh grade, when they get to middle school, is when you still, you're really seeing the drop. Seventh grade is when it's completely down, all right? And if you go to seventh grade here, 41% pass the math and only 22% pass the reading. And then they get to high school. That's your Sonia that you just saw, okay? This is how we see that this is trajectory of long-term English learners is created. And they come to be because of weak progress, poorly implemented and consistent models, and partial access to the curriculum. Your English learners and many Latinos do not have access to your advanced courses, to your GT courses, to your AP courses, to the core curriculum, because they're over here learning English. And they're learning English at the expense of their education. Okay? So what we need to do now is really put a lot into working with teachers, administrators, teacher preparation, administrative preparation, monitoring at the state level, making sure that we're doing both at the same time. That we're developing language that is contextualized in a rigorous curriculum. That the kids have access to the rigorous curriculum and there's ways to impact that. And when I talk about rigorous curriculum, then I'm talking about, um, I'm rushing through this, and you all have a handout. I have handouts over here. I brought them late, so don't leave without getting them. I have them. When we're talking about complex text in high school, this is where it's really important to understand. But children, before third grade, they're learning how to read, the mechanics of reading. After third grade, kids have to read in order to learn. And complex text 
the textbooks in high school now. The text becomes a pedagogical tool now. It's a different purpose. It's to inform, it's to interpret, it's for students to infer. It takes on a whole different meaning, and that's what we got to get into. So these are some of the points that I would like to see that we recommend. Resources needed to promote stronger programs, access to the full curriculum, teachers that know how to develop both, preparing teachers, counselors, and administrators all right, that can support this. Also, understanding that in Texas, we need to demand, and I think this is a short-term one that we can deal with, we need to demand that the state now find out, track where our long-term English learners are across all districts in Texas. And we also need to demand that districts go back and start looking at their data early on so that we can avoid the kind of situation that we see there with Sonia. We will be talking more in detail about this as we meet in our, in our breakout room, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But understand that the rigor in standards and state standards have gone up a lot, okay? And that's being equal. All kids need high standards, that's great. But we're talking about equity, the other side. We need them to have access to curriculum. And in order for them to have access, they need the trained personnel and they need the schools and the school budgets so that we can get this done. It's a sad picture, but it's a reality. Thank you. I'm sorry I rushed through this, but thank you. Next up, presenters from Writer Summer Salvador Cotteres, Salvador is an economist, and he's at UT of Rio Grande Valley. So I want, I want to thank everyone, uh, and I want to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me, and Marie. Marie, of course, couldn't be here. She really wanted to be here, but I got, I got lucky enough uh, that she did. <laughs> so, uh, so the opinions that I'll present uh, are our own, and then um, they're not necessarily all the employer, uh, just for disclaimer purposes. Uh, so I'm basically going to give you a summary of the presentation I'm going to give uh, later on. I'm going to just give you five Five, five slides that I think summarizes, I think, uh, a lot of what we're going to be discussing later. So here is uh, some of the data that has been presented in different forms. And this is the share of uh, Hispanic uh, total population by county. And I think what, what's interesting here is, I think what already been pointed out, is Texas, California, Florida, New York, have the highest uh, concentration of Hispanics. But if you look at just in count, at the county level, you see that most of these are in South Texas, along the border, Southern California, maybe Central, uh, Central California, uh, and, and in, uh, New Mexico here. Uh, so this is the share, so the total number of Hispanics over the uh, total number of people in those, in those particular counties. If we were to present this as a growth rate, and I think uh, if we presented this, we would see a slightly different uh, patterns here, and if we were to look at this at uh, uh, for under 20, we'll see a slightly uh, different uh, patterns here. But the idea here is that Hispanics are a, a big, a big, large uh, portion of the population. They uh, they're going to affect the economy in the years to come. So if Hispanics perform poorly, the economy as a whole should, on average, perform you know less than uh, optimally. So so what I'm going to do is I'll present a couple of I think key statistics and then show us some. Uh, data that I think uh, suggests some areas of concern, mostly dealing with education. I think that's, that's the central theme here, and then you know provide some some thoughts. Here. So this this picture on the left here is the median income of uh, Hispanics relative to the median income uh, at the county level, and I think not surprisingly you see that uh, counties that have a large share of Hispanics also tend to have Hispanics who earn roughly about what the median uh, earnings are. But you don't see that anywhere uh, anywhere else. And I think what's more telling here is that in, even in counties in which you have a very large number of Hispanics, say for example, Hidalgo County, where it's 90% Hispanic, the Hispanics on average earn 90% uh, of what the average person in Hidalgo County earns. So that 10% of the population is, uh, you know, is out earning the average, uh, average Hispanic. Uh, the, set, the third picture I'm going to present to you here is the, uh, so I'm just looking at counties with over 100,000 Hispanics uh, here in Texas. And I've broken down by uh, educational categories. So on the very top is those with uh, graduate degrees, second to the top is those with bachelors, some post-secondary, uh, high school or equivalent, and then the very bottom is the uh, less than high school uh, 
education. And I think a couple of things become quite uh, clear here is that there are differences across the state when it comes to earnings, so median, uh, median earnings, as it relates to the share of the Hispanic population. So Baja, for example, which is where we're at, uh, roughly 60% of the population is, is Hispanic, and they're roughly right around the middle, so you see most of the border, uh, border counties on the right side, the Paso, Cameron, Hidalgo, uh, Webb counties uh, on the right side. So you, you'll tend to see that for every single education profile that the border, Hispanics along the border, uh, or those Hispanics in which, they, uh, in which Hispanics are the larger share of the population, they tend to earn less than if they would, uh, if, uh, if Hispanics they would live in, of Hispanics who live in uh, states that have a lower share of Hispanic, uh, Hispanic population. I think the other thing that is telling from this story here is the, the slopes here of at least the last uh, the first two lines. And you see this big penalty here of being a Hispanic and uh, having a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree along the border relative to being a Hispanic uh, say in Montgomery or Denton uh, or Tarrant, uh, you know, being part of the Dallas MSA, the, the Houston uh, MSA, uh, uh, the Austin MSAs. So if you look at if you look at those with uh, uh, graduate degree, say at Paso, Cameron, and Hidalgo, they, they roughly have the, the same, uh, roughly about the same median income than those who only hold a bachelor's degree, say in Montgomery, Brasoria, and uh, Fort uh, Worth. So, so what, what can be driving these differences? So it's clear that it's not education alone. So, uh, so there's a couple of slides that I, I'm not presenting here, I'll present them later, but what we're going to find is that Hispanics on average have low levels of educational attainment. Uh, if I look at the share of uh, Hispanics with bachelor's degree at any given uh, county in, in Texas, we'll see that the numbers are quite small relative to the overall population in those particular counties. Uh, so that's, that's, so that's one problem. We don't have enough Hispanics to get college degrees. A second problem is that even if you account for college degree uh, completions, uh, Hispanics with a college degree are still earning less than somebody who has been a uh, non-Hispanic white with a college degree. So, there's, so even though uh, you know, the problem is that Hispanics are earning less because they have lower education, traditional having a higher, uh, greater levels of educational attainment, you still see these uh, wage differences. So these, these two lines here represent the, uh, they're the unexplained earning gaps between Hispanics in Texas and Hispanics in the U.S. And on the, on the top line is, suggests here that roughly, uh, roughly speaking about uh, Hispanics earn 5% less in, uh, in the U.S. than non-Hispanic whites. And in Texas that number is somewhere around 10 to 15, uh, 10%. If we were to look at this by educational attainment, again, we, we, we see that the differences between Hispanics in the U.S. and Hispanics in Texas for low levels of education are not all that much, but they're still lower than the non-Hispanic whites. However, if we look at it by educational attainment, the differences are quite stark. One, Hispanics earn less than the, uh, than the average non-Hispanic white, both in the U.S. and in Texas, but much more importantly, Hispanics in Texas earn much less uh, than uh, relative to non-Hispanic white than just the, uh, your average uh, Hispanic in the U.S. So some of the uh, things to consider here, uh, things that might be important to think about as we think about policies here is what might be driving these uh, wage differences. Clearly, education cannot explain this alone, although access to education is important. Uh, one has to think about, for, uh, perhaps I think what uh, was alluded to right before, uh, and said here is that Perhaps there's something to be said about the quality of the education. Maybe this is the way to teach uh, a certain segment of the Hispanic population. Uh, maybe uh, uh, teach preparation, etc. Uh, perhaps maybe uh, this is a field of study. Maybe Hispanics are getting college degrees, but maybe they're not the correct uh, college degrees. However, I don't, I, I, I don't buy the story of this information uh, asymmetries in which Hispanics somehow don't have enough information to be able to make up their mind as to which degrees is going to give them higher returns or higher ROI on their investment. I think there's a likely something to be said with this equality of access. You know, what is the starting line? Hispanics on average have lower uh, resources, lower uh, uh, access to uh, uh, 
half of resources are lower, and therefore, uh, and and they go, they, they tend to go to schools that have uh, more poorly funded, which gives them an unfair, uh, an unfair uh, starting line when they when they, when they when they start at the education level when they're more formative years, uh, in the, so in the, say kindergarten, first grade. By the time they get to high school or college, m much much of the uh, unobserved of uh, heterogeneity you expect to observe uh, within this uh, within this group, it's uh, it's already been uh, it's already been baked uh, in. And then more generally, this this uh, idea of uh, macroeconomic shock. So we know that during the Great Recession, uh, Hispanics on average were much more likely to be displaced in the labor market. So the unemployment rates shot up much more much faster than they did for the overall population. So um, so there's a couple of things we need to think about when thinking about uh, public <coughs> services, things like uh, the Workforce Commission, what do they do to help uh, people in transition, uh, uh, lose their jobs, uh, pro uh, other programs, and then there's this, uh, this idea of family uh, support. Thank you. The presenters, uh, uh, Oscar Munoz, Oscar is the director for the Colonial Programs at Texas a &M, and he's going to speak to the area of housing. Good afternoon. My name is Alex. I want to thank Rogelio Juan Roger for bringing this together. Um, I think it's a lot time has passed and I think it's time that we start coming together. I think it's very important um, for us to start sharing what we know and I think that um, we also need to start moving forward together and we also need to consider the next generation. Each one of us needs to start training the next generation so that they can keep this motion going. I want to talk about um, the American dream. Unfortunately, as our colleagues have already told us, we're not at the top of the ratings, we're not at the top of the rankings. For us, for Latinos, Hispanics, whatever you want to call us, um, the American dream oftentimes is unaffordable. We need to start reframing and we need to start sharing some of the information that we know about what it is and how we go about buying our own homes. We can go through the through the ratios just like everybody else has done, but we know what they are. The things that we need to keep in mind though is that twenty percent of the population in the US are living in rural or small towns located over 97% of our landmass, 97% of our landmass. So we're everywhere, everywhere. Um, of course, um, rural areas have um, much less diverse than the U.S. as a whole. Moving forward, I think that there are a lot of things, a lot of issues that need to be addressed that are starting to change for us and for everybody as a whole. Primary is that our senior population is growing by approximately 10,000 retirees daily. daily. Census Bureau projects that senior growth from, will be from 13 to 20 percent of the population by 2050. Rural, rural America is not necessarily agriculture anymore. 20% of the rural workforce is um, based on education, health and human services, and um, is starting to be influenced also by um, electronics. Um, what are the colonias from the San Antonians in the group, the original San Antonians in the group, um, always referred to the valley as being down in the valley. South of Laredo, further than Laredo, because if you say Laredo in the valley, those are fighting words. 
of the way we frame and advocate um, for Latino health policy. As we are standing, you know, getting, we're here together to talk about a Latino family economic platform. Um, so one is that generation matters in terms of health, for Latino health. And two is that health policy alone, um, in the traditional sense that we might think of in terms of health care and health insurance, is not going to be enough to include the 
of Latinos. Um, so first, when it comes to Latino health, generation matters. Uh, in a lot of the studies that we had up to maybe the 80s, um, we couldn't account for generation in the data. So we didn't know, you know, not just immigrant and U.S. born, but second and third generation. Um, and in fact, until the 70s, so we couldn't even, um, we didn't have data sets that had enough data where we could actually study them. Um, so what is to our advantage when it comes to health is the renewing of the Latino population with every wave of immigrants. And the reason is that immigrants, um, in general, tend to be a healthier, are a healthier group than their counterparts who, from their country of origin. And um, a select group in terms of being healthier, uh, in terms of what I'm talking about today, being healthier. And, and so it is with Latinos as well. Um, so in spite of lower socioeconomic status, and in spite of limited access to health care, um, Latinos have health outcomes on par with the most advantaged group in the United States of the larger groups, which are not Hispanic whites. Uh, this is true for birth outcomes. This is true for children's chronic health conditions, um, for cardiovascular disease, and for our lifespans. We live longer and at least as long as some Hispanic whites. Now, that's a paradox because your socioeconomic status and having access to health care is really important in health outcomes. Um, so, they, um, the children of immigrants uh, benefit from the health of the, the mom. Um, so, the other thing that we know about children of immigrants is that they have the greatest, not only do they have a better health outcomes at birth, uh, and that advantage actually continues into uh, uh, the young uh, adolescent years in terms of chronic health conditions. Um, but they also uh, have other better outcomes in terms of social mobility. Second generations, children of immigrants, uh, have the highest social mobility in comparison to their parents than any other generation. And Latinos actually are part of that. Um, part of that trend. Okay, so these generational uh, trend, uh, uh, factors affect Mexican Americans um, the, the, the greatest part of the Mexican American population. And that is because both Mexican Americans, and I know I keep going back to the Latino and Mexican Americans, I'm going to focus on the data on Mexican Americans right here. Uh, most Mexican Americans are first and second generation. So although only 38% of Mexican Americans are um, immigrant, okay, 38%, among the 62% who are U.S. born, 35% are second generation, children of immigrants. So together, first and second generations make up three quarters of all Mexican American, Mexican origin people in the U.S. So when we're talking about Mexican Americans, we're talking about immigrant families, right? Families, so somebody has an aunt or an uncle or whatever. And I always find this fascinating, uh, three quarters, and that's first and second, and then uh, the rest of them. So, so the good news is that these are generations that have started healthy, okay? Um, so from a policy perspective, we want to focus on those trends. So we don't have to start by thinking about how to reverse diseases and those kinds of things. But the window of opportunity is small. Okay? Beyond the first and second generation, the health of Latinos deteriorates significantly to where the all those outcomes I was telling you about, birth outcomes, um, how much how long we live, uh, things like that. Um, they become, they deteriorate significantly to where we are comparable 
to groups in this country who are doing the worst. I mean, literally rates double, for example, in terms of infant mortality and over and things like that. Now, those things are important because, I don't even tell you that birth outcomes like low birth weight, it's not just how well you're going to do the first six months. That's going to affect your health throughout your entire life. Obviously, infant mortality, you know, that we, we can reverse that. So, um, so, this is where policy comes in, that we need to have policies to kind of maintain that health, but we know that we have very high um, uh, rates of uninsurance. I'm not even going to go through the numbers. I, we all know those are very high. Um, they, uh, the uninsured rate in Texas is higher uh, than comparable averages for Latinos in Arizona, California, and Florida. We also know South Texas is disproportionately hit by um, levels of low insurance. More than 40% that from the data that we have of the population in, on the border is uninsured. Um, and as we know, the Affordable Care Act, if we had had Medicaid, would have made a dent. In other places, the dent that, that the ACA has made for Latinos is significant. Okay, and then the other part of the so insurance is that although Latinos live longer, and I think you guys have know this, you know, it's Wall Street Journal and everything. Um, not Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times. Um, very, very surprised that Latinos live longer, that's the news people. The problem is, and this is something that uh, some, um, a colleague of mine, and we've done research together, he um, wanted to see, well, what's the health like of these Latinos who are living so long? And it's horrible. Horrible, I mean, um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. And the, the thing with this is that, um, it's funny because I think we in the Latino community know this, and we have kind of come to accept that growing old means being sick and being frail and being, and that's not true for everyone. It's only true for low income populations in the country. I mean, you know, people do go and play golf and do all that stuff, but not our elderly. You know, it, not all of them, but in general, very, very poor outcomes. And it has to do with a lifetime of cumulative disadvantage, um, poor wages, harsh working conditions, stress, especially with people who have been, who came here undocumented, all the things they dealt with. Um, poverty obviously is totally connected to health. I, I don't need to tell you how that works. Nutrition, pollution, those kinds of things. So the bottom line is that no population can thrive without what is called social protection. Um, social protection is about it's it's a, a society that has policies that help people manage. Um, you know, situations that put them at risk. And so when, you know, including unemployment, disability, it's, it's all those things that sometimes we um, Latinos don't have. It doesn't mean that we're going to have a perfect society. It's, it, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a society where we're going to have those social protections. Everybody, not just certain groups. So I think that the takeaway that I want to leave you with today is that you know, in terms of framing this thing, is that we start out healthy, but that that window is really, is really small and we need to do things quickly. Um, and that all these things, health policy is labor policy, economic policy, education policy, immigration policy. So I think that it's, I thought it was interesting because I'm the fourth one of the four, and we're all ending with the same message, and that is equity. Problem is equity. Um, so I think that this conference is right on target in that an aim, a major aim here is working toward, toward equity. Um, you know, we know generally that people of color have poor health outcomes. They have poor health, I mean, the data shows poor health outcomes regardless of our socioeconomic status. So if you compare people of color, and that's true for Latinos, African Americans, and not Hispanic whites with the same education, same income, all of that stuff. 
the, the health of people of color is worse. That's an issue of equity. Thank you very much. direction in terms of the breakout panels and then something about what happens after the breakout panels and why we think of that panel this evening. Uh, I want to get behind the board because I want to give you some pierdas and I want to respond to that. In case you get mad. Just two or three points. One, I hate the word, uh, I can't pronounce it in English, vulnerable person. Oh, oh, that one. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, I'm glad we haven't used it so far, okay? Because the big narrative, uh, if, if you heard the debates on the on TV about the, the ACA, you know, the, the, the current administration, they want to help those. They want to make sure, right? And that has a very narrow definition. And it gets back to even Henry's point about who, whose narrative are we listening to, right? The other word, I kind of want to avoid a little bit, and we should when we're in the discussion, is poverty. And partly, and the academicians can correct me, but that poverty measures, you know, really don't give you whether that's a living, that's not a living wage, right? In other words, to me, we should be looking at 200% above poverty to even have what we call a living wage. So, you know, at the very beginning, when I said that we have a half of our familias and over half of our children barely surviving and they said, yeah, they're making it, but who the hell wants to make it? From, from week to week, paycheck to paycheck. So poverty, you know, we should think again, what kind of, uh, you know, life do we want for our families and for our children? And so, because we tend to then want to really narrow to those 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 ones, you know, people you know? And so I, I really I'm hoping I'm making some sense, but I think again, what is the quality of life we want our families and the kind of opportunities so families can create for children with us. So I, that's that's sort of my you know little per, perspective on those two points in, in terms of what because when you look at income because even the two points that have been made by both uh, uh, Salvador, in particular, and, and uh, Yolanda, that even when we have the same level of education, supposedly, we're still making less money and we still have less access to care. What's wrong with that? So what does that tell you? And again, she says equity. And we get back around to, again, the equities that are not built, that more inequitable policies were not, that are there you know, if you will, and how do we change that to with a different narrative, you know, that we want to project forward, right? So I just wanted to mention that and then, uh, the slide out. The one has been feeling very vulnerable right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, look, we're running just a tiny bit late, but um, we're gonna make up that time. So, but one thing that we definitely have to do is uh, I'll, I'll direct you right now to where the panels are. If you're on the education panel, you can exit out these doors, and it is the last door on the left here. The education panel <clears throat> will be meeting in this building. All the other panels are in the southwest room, or the southwest rooms, which are in the Dulado building, which as soon as you walk out of these sliding double doors, is the building that you're staring at, and it'll say Durango building right there. So <clears throat> all the other panels are over there, and, and there's a little construction going on, and it's another story for another day, but um, uh, just ignore all that, and you'll see there's some signage and whatnot there. So the uh, labor uh, workforce development panel is there, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, health and human services panel is there, uh, and I'm missing one, which one am I missing? And housing. Okay, and please finish at 5, because at, at 5.15 we have a nice little uh, wine and a uh, little reception in here. And then we also have dinner and uh, teatro as well. So uh, please finish on time at 5 o'clock because we, we'd like you back here at 5.15. Thank you very much.